Uh, a woman who was uh, uh, aide-de-camp, very close to Karen Hughes, called me. And we had been in touch and gotten to know one another. And she said, we'd like to have you come to the Bush-Cheney campaign and to head up the media coalition's uh, effort. And, uh, and I was really uh, excited about that. And uh, as a side note, she said, I know you're married. I know you have children. I know you live in, in Washington. You, know, you can just plan to leave them there because you're going to be working all the time. And you know, the time frame is short. And, and of course, that was not something I could do. I, I, you know, uh, we're a family. And so we got into our Dodge Caravan. Our boys were one and three. Uh, we arrived in Austin, Texas on what surely must have been the hottest days in a hot state. It was 118 degrees the day we arrived. Wow. They had been in the middle of a drought. Everything was brown and tan. Uh, to the degree that our children could communicate, they wanted to know where their pet cats were. They wanted to know why they didn't have a front lawn, why, we're why we were living in a walk-up, two-bedroom apartment, what happened to our house. By the way, the woman living in our house temporarily was a woman we didn't know. Um, you know, and I thought, what on earth have I done? You know, and now I'm working six and a half days a week. Uh, I'm not seeing my wife and children, even though they're in the same uh, town. Uh, you know, the biggest office I had worked in, for Dan Coates and Gary Bauer, a, you know, a big office was 20 people. I remember walking into the Bush Cheney campaign and seeing, as this room is, a sea of people and cubicles and, you know, getting a n another email every three seconds. I thought, wow, you know? And my job was to head the coalition's department of the media effort. And it was tailor-made. I mean, from the minute I got there, I really loved what I did. But it was a, it was a full effort. Karen Hughes's uh, deputy offered me a position in the media affairs office of the White House. And I thought, that's absolutely terrific. And I didn't say yes. I wanted to think and pray about it. Uh, on the same day, very uh, late in the afternoon, I received a call from a man whom I had only met twice, Carl Rove. And he said, and he, uh, he has a sort of joking manner, he said, Tim, he said, I'm calling to change your life, you know. <laughs> and he was laughing and I wasn't. <laughs> and he said, I want to uh, offer you a position as a special assistant to the president and the deputy director of the White House Office of Public Liaison. And your job is going to be to be the point man for the president with all the conservatives, with all the faith-based organizations, with, you know, with all the think tanks, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, to say I was speechless would be an overstatement. You know? And I said yes and moved from the transition office. Uh, my uh, wife and children, my mother and father, my aunt came for the inauguration. At the 11th hour, because of the strangeness of the transition, we were all invited to the East Room didn't know the president or vice president were going to be there. I was sworn in, which was remarkable, as a commissioned officer to the president, taken to my cavernous office on the first floor of the Eisenhower building next to the White House. Now, cavernous office, is there sarcasm in that? Uh, you know, I, not? My, my, I mean, I worked in the Senate and had a wonderful space, and, but I had never, you know, b this was the White House. Yeah. And, uh, and it was a new day. And, uh, and as they say, we were really off to the races. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I have to say, the, the average tenure in the Senate and in the White House is 18 months. Because, to allude to the first question you asked, the hours are intense. Uh, you know, uh, there's not a time when the White House closes for business. And, of course, my part of the portfolio in the Office of Public Liaison was uh, to be in touch with people. Uh, and to make sure that I was gathering from them all of their concerns and being able to feed back into the White House bloodstream all of that and then to take to them President Bush's agenda. Uh, I can honestly say, again with humility, that I got to work at close range with the President uh, because of Carl's uh, trust and generosity. And, and I got to know uh, President Bush uh, in a way that is probably very unique uh, in American political history, and I can say that he is a man of 100 percent integrity and character, a man uh, who is, um, well, he's one of the best men I've ever met, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, uh, I spent some time with him very recently in Dallas, which is very generous of him, and he's a, he's a great person, and I got to know uh, the First Lady as well, 
and, uh, and I think that she is grace personified. Mm -hmm. You were in the White House until 2008. Yes. Your leave-taking from the White House uh, came about, though, under somewhat awkward circumstances. Right. Uh, would you mind say, sharing a little about that? Well, first, you're nice to say awkward circumstances. I'll put it another way. Uh, I went into an absolute personal crisis that has been unequaled in my life, and I pray never to be again. All my own fault, all, call, all, all caused by me, uh, greatly humiliating, causing and bringing great humiliation upon my wife and children, my family, my closest friends, uh, the President of the United States, uh, and everybody who I knew, uh, who I considered to be a good friend. Uh, I had been writing a, uh, a, a newspaper column for my hometown paper for many years. I wrote on everything except for politics. Uh, all the things that I loved, art, music, philosophy, the things that, that meant most to me. Um, and I began lifting, I'll, I'll say it another way, I began taking liberally uh, from other people's writing and putting it into my own, plagiarizing. Uh, and, uh, and one of the uh, bloggers uh, uncovered my plagiarizing, gave it uh, to uh, generally on the blog, and, and was picked up by uh, one of the newspapers in my hometown. Uh, and of course, this became uh, an immediately uh, important and big story. And when I was asked about this by the reporter, I said, yes, I am guilty as charged immediately. In fact, she sent me an email, and I sent the email back to her in response, I think within, within a half an hour. And I knew at that minute that my career in, uh, at the White House was done. Uh, and it was the, uh, as I say, uh, all self-inflicted, all of my fault, born of 100% pride. Um, my goal, having turned in my resignation, was that I would finish out my work, I would make sure that it would be seamless for the person who would take my position, and I would go quietly into that good night. Um, except for God, in His infinite providence, had something else in mind. Uh, Bill Buckley once said of uh, one of his close friends, he said, I had spent my life looking for the perfect Christian, and I found him in a non-observant Jew, speaking of his great friend, Dick Clerman. Well, without the non-observant part, I received a telephone call from Josh Bolton, who was the president's chief of staff. Right. Um, I could spend the next nine years telling you what a remarkable human being Josh Bolton is. And he called me and he said, Tim, I want you to come over to the office. And I said, Josh, you are great to call me. This means more than you know, just reaching out as a friend. But um, I have vowed to myself that I will never darken the doorstep of the West Wing again. I really <coughs> believe that I have besmirched it. And he said, I appreciate that. I appreciate what you're saying but I really want to speak to you. And, um, and I said, okay. And I went over to see him, and uh, it was just him and me, and I thought, uh, this is important. And I apologized to him, and his grace and mercy is almost beyond human comprehension. And uh, we had about a half an hour together. And as I was leaving, he said to me, oh, and by the way, the boss, speaking of the president, wants to see you. And so I got to the ante office, ante room, and I heard a voice say, come on in. And it was George W. Bush into the Oval Office. And I thought, uh, either I'm early or the other people are late because it's just the president. And I went in, he asked me to shut the door. Um, at that point, I was in such a zone that it's kind of like in Bugs Bunny where you close the door and it sounds like it's this eternal giant door, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh boy, you know. And it was just the president and me. And I said to the president, uh, I owe you, and he stopped me. And he said, Tim, you're forgiven. And I can honestly say that for the first time in my life, I was speechless. And I paused and I said, but sir, I, and he said, stop. He said, I've known grace and mercy in my life. 
and you're forgiven. And I said, but I owe you an apology. I said, you should have taken me by the lapels and thrown me into Pennsylvania Avenue for what I did. And he, he said, um, as I say, I've known grace and mercy. You're forgiven. Now, he said, we can spend the next 20 or 30 minutes talking about all of this, or we can spend our time talking about the last eight years. And then he did something which was equally amazing, which is that he walked me over to the seat of honor in front of the fireplace in the Oval Office, uh, the place where the vice president or a head of state sits when they're in the Oval, and he asked me to sit down. And we sat and talked uh, for a long time about all of the events of the last eight years. And after the meeting, um, I'm sure I gave him a hug, vice versa, thinking that would be the last time I'll see George W. Bush. And as I was leaving the office, he said, oh, and by the way, he said, I want you to bring Jenny and the boys here to the office next week because I want to tell them what a great father and husband you are. And again, I was utterly dumbfounded. Uh, whatever the word humiliation means, if there's a Webster's definition with three entries, I was all three at that moment. 